Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new episode of Harnessing Helium. I'm Jacob Swin, Product Marketing Manager here at Helium, and super excited today to be talking with Oscar and Tom from Microsoft. Um, you guys might, uh, old Helium users might know we integrated with Azure IoT Hub with Helium Console not too long ago, and um, that was really exciting for us to be able to do that partnership with Microsoft. So, um, Oscar and Tom are here to talk a little bit about things you can do with IoT Hub and Microsoft and Helium. So, um, Oscar and Tom, great to have you guys on today. Why don't you give us a little intro about yourselves? Tell us what you do at Helium. Uh, I'm so sorry, at Microsoft, I'm the one at Helium, um, and all of that. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go first, Jacob. Really uh, appreciate uh, the invitation. Glad to be here and talking to everyone. Um, I'm Tom Patton. I'm in the Azure IoT Engineering Organization. Uh, in the strategic engagement team. So we work with customers and partners on interesting new technologies. Obviously, one of those is with the Helium uh, guys who's, who's really uh, done this integration so that we can put, put our networks together. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Great. Perfect. Uh, excellent. And uh, my name is Oscar Naim. I'm a program manager in the same organization, in the Azure IoT engineering organization, same as Tom. And uh, my, my role is to help customers and partners create sound architectures that um, you know, properly leverage our Azure IoT platform. Uh, we also listen to feedback um, and make sure we, we represent that voice of the customer back to the product team. Gotcha, awesome, thank you. All right, so with that, give us some history of Microsoft and just the IoT business, um, what you guys have been doing, how long you've been in the IoT business and how has it been developing? Sure. I guess, you know, in a certain sense, Microsoft's been in the IoT business uh, since its origins. If you think of back, uh, even like things like Windows CE was one of the in, in initial embedded operating systems that would have been used in IoT projects, even before sort of the terminology of IoT uh, really was in the vernacular. Uh, but we kind of came into it in earnest uh, with our cloud offerings about six years back uh, with an investment curve of around $4 billion. And that's across sort of everything from data ingestion to analytics, to application platforms and developing the ecosystem of partners uh, around that. Um, and, you know, it's been really a successful business for Microsoft. Uh, in that time, uh, we've been recognized as leaders by Gartner, by IDC, by Forrester, and, uh, you know, really uh, been engaged with uh, many of the big brands around the world and, and the, the, uh, in very innovative uh, scenarios and solutions. And, uh, you know, recently, uh, I would say kind of, you know, looking back when we first developed our cloud offerings around IoT Hub, device provisioning service, and the ancillary services around there, uh, we were really depending on uh, people to figure out how to get their devices, you know, into, um, in, into Azure. Uh, over the past couple of years with the, with the advent of, of LoRaWAN technology, uh, we've really taken a keen interest here and we're working, you know, with Helium and others in the ecosystem. Uh, we've joined the LoRa Alliance. Uh, our, our general manager, Tony Shakib, sits on the board there. And, uh, you know, really been interesting to see the kind of innovations that our customers are using uh, by coupling these two technologies together. Yeah, no, that's great. So just piggybacking on that a little bit. So, I mean, obviously we at Helium love seeing the excitement around LoRaWAN and that technology. Um, how do you incorporate that into Azure solutions? Oscar, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about this one. Sure, absolutely. Let me actually share my screen. Uh, there we go. You should be able to see my screen now. So, so how do uh, we- Hold on, Oscar, oh. we can't see it. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot to click share. There we go. Okay, perfect. now you should be able to see. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so, 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 so basically, uh, how do we integrate uh, LoRaWAN with Azure IoT? You know, thanks to the Helium uh, Azure IoT Hub Connector, this is extremely easy. And, and I want to use um, an asset tracking use case in order to illustrate this. So basically, we have um, uh, we are using Semtex uh, LoRa Edge Tracker, which is a very particular kind of tracker because it doesn't have a GPS. And, uh, and it uses, uh, it scans for Wi-Fi and other um, geolocation signals, then pushes all that data to the cloud. And, and the idea is for that computation to happen there so that we can save on battery and, and also on the actual cost of the hardware for that tracker. 
And the flow goes more or less like this. Uh, messages go from the tracker to the LoRaWAN gateway to the Helium platform and through the connector, they get to IoT Hub. And once you have these messages in IoT Hub, uh, we trigger an Azure function that does all the communication with Semtex uh, LoRa Cloud and, and do the conversion to lat long coordinates, which we then display in Power BI using uh, Azure Maps. So let me show you very quickly here. Um, this is the Helium console, and we have the Azure IoT Hub integration here. We have defined one already. And as you can see, it's only a few configuration parameters that you have to provide from IoT Hub. Then you create a device. In this case, we created this LoRa Edge tracker device, and then you connect it to Azure via that connector. And voila, that's all you need to do. Here, you, you, you notice that um, we have been sending messages for the, for the past few days. Um, here we have uh, the actual IoT Hub instance uh, where you can see all the messages uh, flowing through. And then we are visualizing these in Power BI using Azure Maps. And I should probably point out that um, in a few future episode of um, uh, Helium Hacks, uh, I'll be presenting these uh, as an open source project together with my colleague, uh, Janet Kopp. So back to you. Perfect. All right. Yes, I was going to reference that hacks. Well, I'll uh, make a note of the date and time at the end of this episode, too, for anyone who wants to tune in. But very cool, Oscar. Thank you. So like you mentioned Power BI and those types of things. So I know Microsoft has a lot of like adjacent tech that complements IoT Hub. What are some key integrations once that data has been ingested? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. If you think about uh, you know, all these devices out in the environment coming through Helium and, and kind of being delivered to the front door of the Azure IoT platform, you just talk about a few attributes you know, above the cut line there and how our customers are benefiting uh, from those. If we start off with uh, sort of the IoT platform itself, uh, you know, some of, some of the differentiation that we have is a sort of IoT central capabilities here where it's easy to build an application quickly and get up and running and be able to scale this application to, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices uh, without having to worry about how all of the different platform services sort of fit together and are glued together. So that's kind of one area uh, where we see a lot of uh, momentum these days. Uh, second is really in the power platform. So I think a, a great, you know, if you think about the end-to-end -end flow from data ingestion through analysis, eventually it has to land somewhere where people can do something with it. And the power platform gives people a low-code, no-code sort of citizen developer uh, palette that they can build these applications directly using their IoT data. So if you can manage an Excel formula and format, you know, a PowerPoint uh, deck, that's the kind of technical skill required to build these power apps. And uh, the, the, the picture here is depicting sort of a, an inventory management uh, solution for hospital stocking levels uh, of the great kind of uh, scenario that we see being uh, implemented with LoRaWAN. Uh, the third part I'd talk about is actually all the way up here in the Dynamics uh, 365 uh, part of the stack. So whereas Power Platform and Power Apps give you a design tool that allows uh, those these citizen developers to, uh, to build applications on their IoT uh, data and, and effect change you know, out there in the world. Uh, the Dynamics 365 offerings, including connected field service, lets you completely manage that business process. So if you want to be able to respond to anomalies uh, that you're detecting using a vibration detector you know, on a uh, HVAC unit in some building, uh, and you know all the information about that asset, uh, connected field service lets you dispatch a technician with the right skill sets, the right equipment to go address that, you know, guide them into the right place and manage the transactions around uh, providing that service. Uh, so that's, that's one of the great things we've seen with uh, a lot of different scenarios actually in Azure is this connection between data ingestion, processing and application platforms uh, that give our customers sort of the full range of capabilities they need to deliver uh, business value. Yeah, no, I love hearing that. And, you know, when we talk to people, one thing that they always want is more user friendly ways to kind of look at data and use that data and things like that. So, um, you know, like you said, as long as you can manipulate an Excel spreadsheet or something, I mean, that that definitely makes it easier for people to access and use that data. So excellent. Um, so what type of applications are you guys at Microsoft kind of seeing with LoRaWAN right now? 
You know, it's, it's interesting because I kind of would break it down into more constrained uh, geographical places. We see a lot of Laurel land in uh, things like managing multi-dwelling units uh, or other kinds of property management, facilities management, stadiums, anywhere where there's a, a constrained amount of space and somebody wants to get up and running quickly. Um, we see also in those constrained spaces, a lot of uh, uh, factory overlay networks inside of manufacturing environments where you don't want to touch the existing uh, network infrastructure, but you want to get insights from the production line. Uh, smart metering, of course, would be another big uh, one we're seeing a lot of. Uh, and then, you know, things like helium are really contributing and I think expanding the breadth of what customers can do uh, with this technology. So we're seeing, you know, environmental monitoring or supply chain or other kinds of uh, projects popping into view now. Uh, where sort of the ubiquity of the network is a, is a key element of the use case. But uh, everything from, you know, monitoring apple trees uh, all the way to, like I said, uh, you know, making sure that the cleaning fluid in the bathroom has been uh, replaced property from a sort of a multi-dwelling unit or, or industrial space management. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's been really interesting just in my time at Helium to kind of see all the different solutions and things that people come up with and that they use LoRaWAN for. Um, this is kind of a curveball question for you, but are there any areas that you like predict could be big um, growth areas for solutions and things with LoRaWAN, just looking down the road a little bit, things like, you know, you mentioned all of those solutions already, but things like you see, okay, this could really benefit from like LoRa and Helium and things like that. You know, I think uh, the agriculture space is hesitant, right? We've seen yeah. projects get started. Uh, we've seen a, a couple of great successes actually in South America using LoRaWAN. We've got some stuff going on in the U.S., but I kind of feel like it's one of those areas that is ripe for further innovation. And, uh, you know, especially with the, the focus on environmental sustainability, all these kind of things, I think the mm -hmm. broader environment of making, you know, tracking forest fires, looking at forest ecology and health or monitoring agricultural processes across a, a wide area. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the, in the coming future. I don't know, yeah. Oscar, we, we've, we've been on a lot of calls. Uh, what, what, what is it from your, your perspective? Well, actually, I have something here to share with you about that. Perfect. Um, because, you know, I, I think that it, from a technology point of view, digital twins is going to be very relevant uh, for many of these solutions. And, and the reason for that is because with digital twins, you can model environment. And, and here in the screen, uh, you are seeing a, a real instance of Azure Digital Twins uh, in the Azure portal. And, and the reason or, or, or how you can model the environment is through a, a language called uh, Digital Twins Definition Language, or DTDL. And this is based on JSON-LD. And with this, you can represent everything from people, uh, places, processes, and things. And you know, the advantage of this is that you can bring these model environments to life by creating a digital twins graph where you are instantiating all these business concepts that you define in the model, you represent them in the graph. And then you have the digital state uh, of, of that environment represented in that graph. And so now you can query the graph and get answers to your business critical questions. Like, you know, what's the space um, um, uh, occupancy or, you know, uh, what's the power consumption from this particular machinery, et cetera. And then from an extensibility point of view, you can add business logic, data processing, or integrate your business system to tailor that solution uh, to your particular uh, scenario. Um, then uh, I also wanted to mention that when you are working with digital twins, one aspect is how do you visualize these digital twins? Because many people find it a lot easier to interact with the graph directly. And uh, we have a tool called Azure Digital Twins Explorer that uh, is actually open source. It's available in GitHub. So you just go to github.com and search for Digital Twins Explorer and, and you will find it. And, and with this, you can very easily uh, represent um, the, 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 the graph uh, that, that, that is modeling your, uh, your, your digital twigs. So in this very simple example, we have a building that has floor and floors have rooms. And, and, and you notice that uh, you know, the rooms, they have properties associated with them, humidity and temperature. Uh, but the cool thing about this is not just how easy it is to, to interact with this directly, but you can also query. Uh, so for example, here, 
we are trying to find all the rooms where the temperature is above 75 degrees and, and we find one room, or we can search for all the rooms where the temperature is actually under 75 degrees and we find, find another room. So very simple, but yet uh, very powerful. Wow, no, that was, that was really cool. Great to see that. Um, following that, Oscar, do you want to talk a little bit? I know you mentioned you're going to be up on Helium Hacks on December 15th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so if you guys want to tune in and watch that, but do you want to talk just a little bit more about what you and um, Yannick are going to be presenting on Hacks? Oh, wait, I don't, want to, I don't want to spoil the- No, the, but you, the, can, the... you can give people a little teaser, make them excited, <laughs> you know? I mean, it well, can be showing more of what you just showed. And no, like sure. So, but, but basically we'll be uh, going into the scenario that I just described at the beginning in detail. Uh, we'll also be talking about all the different components, uh, not only on the Azure side, but also on the Helium platform side. Uh, you know, how do they uh, integrate? Um, we'll talk about different uh, ancillary services from Azure that you can leverage in order to have an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, so it should be fun. Uh, there should be a lot of uh, coding and, and running samples. Hopefully we'll have some bloopers as well. You know, it's a demo. <laughs> and so the problem happen. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, we'll be looking forward to that. Awesome. All right. Yeah. And again, that's December 15th, 2 p.m. Pacific time um, to register for that. So really excited for that. Thank you, Tom and Oscar, for coming on and presenting. I really appreciate it. And I know we at Helium are super excited to be working with Microsoft and, you know, excited for what we're going to do in the future. So thank you guys again. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone.